what you are trying to understand is how to uh, do things iteratively and uh, how to make use of this iterative concept uh, to, to kind of uh, implement uh, your projects or your requirements, business requirements on time. So iteration is uh, it's not a brand new concept. It has been there uh, for a long time. Actually, it's one of the most primitive ways of doing anything uh, creative. So if you take uh, some of the masterpieces from the past, uh, these were created using iterative approaches. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, anyone can create a masterpiece in, in a single brush stroke or in a single go kind of. They had to plan it out very well. They had to take a look at the MVP version of it, uh, then keep improving it until and, and uh, uh, try to understand how things change according to various aspects after you've kind of come up with your painting, and then you will get the masterpiece. I took a painting as an example, but then there are other uh, similar uh, things that you have probably seen uh, uh, in other areas. Like, for example, if you, if you consider uh, space flight uh, or, or bringing something into the outer space, it hasn't been a one-step journey. Uh, the first satellites were launched much earlier, uh, and then people understood the challenges they had. They improved uh, the concept. They improved what a satellite could do. They improved the efficiency uh, of these vehicles. And, and, and then they launch uh, much more capable, much more powerful versions of it. So it's a continuation of a single concept, of course. But uh, it's, it's, it's not about uh, building something uh, that is future-proof in the first go or, or creating something and then thinking, no, I can't change it. I can't adapt. It's, it's, it's not the goal. So it's, it's about identifying a path forward uh, through iterative steps. So if you translate these concepts into software, uh, there are some uh, kinds of architectural uh, 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 related uh, approaches people have come up with, just like uh, the process uh, of, of building things in an agile way. Now, the agile process uh, could be something that people talk about saying uh, it has got to do with uh, sprints, scrums. Uh, there's a person called a scrum master that will do all of the planning for you. Uh, people will break down uh, work into smaller tasks and then they will do burn down and things like that. All of these concepts are familiar. But the actual objective of Agile, the uh, actual reason why uh, Agile processes of, of building software is required is, is uh, for you to iterate, uh, for you to do things step by step, uh, for you to take a look at a bigger problem uh, in a smaller way and, and then keep improving it over a few phases. So it is, it is key to consider Agile or anything similar that you might come up with as an iterative process. But some processes were not inherently iterative in the way it was created, like waterfall. So we have seen uh, some customers of ours uh, who still are trying to adopt waterfall processes have lots of challenges because uh, the way a waterfall process uh, works is that you all know uh, you come up with a set of requirements and, and then uh, you start building something according to these requirements um, and, and you believe that you have figured out everything that you want uh, in the first go and you assume that you have understood the problem very well. And most of the time, it's not the case. And if you work closely with a system integrator, you'll get to know that a customer always says, I need more requirements. And then requirement changes uh, uh, has, has, has kind of become something inevitable. So how to deal with it? Um, Agile itself also won't solve all of the problems that you want uh, as it is. Um, I have been reading about uh, challenges people have uh, in, in iterative approaches. There is this uh, concept of iteration versus incrementation. Like, can you do things in an iterative way or can you do things in an incremental way? The challenge with doing something incrementally is, at the early stages, you will not see anything closer to the final product. You will see a part of the final product. The problem with this is your customer it's not going to be happy. Uh, so we have been working with some of the customers here in the UK. 
and uh, they have suggested uh, us to come up with uh, some kind of a MVP. Some people call it thin slice. And sometimes they identify the MVP scenario to be a subset of the whole thing. Now we can go ahead and just build it for them. What happens if we do that is that they are not going to see exactly what the end result is going to be. So sometimes we work with them and we refine this requirement. We tell them, instead of just taking your big requirement and taking a small part of it and saying, I will just see how these guys do it and I will assume they will complete the rest of the project. Don't do that. Take a cut down version, which does almost everything that you want, but in a very small scale. Now, if you take a look at this uh, slide over here, the iterative approach suggests that. So you might want to uh, build a tool, but initially the customer asks you, uh, I want a tool uh, that can cut something. So I'm, I'm going to build something that can actually cut something for the customer. So he sees something functioning. He's happy. Uh, he, he, he kind of understands that this can do what he wants. And then he starts to think creatively. And he says, no, I don't want this exactly to be like this. This is not the exact thing I want. Shall we work together and improve it a bit? Then comes the second step, the third step. And the final step is exactly what he wants, or almost what he wants. But if you go in the incremental approach, you think you have understood the customer from the first go. And the customer thinks he has told you everything that is in his head in the first go. But the end result might be very far from what the customer actually wanted. So uh, the articles that I've read, many things that I've read on this topic suggest if you do want to do something in steps, don't do it in incremental steps, do it in iterative steps. It is difficult sometimes because you might, you might have to be prepared to throw away something that you initially create and rethink. But this is all a part of improving uh, the overall solution and building uh, what you exactly want. So you need to plan for these things very carefully. And you need to think a lot. So the slides that follow uh, are taking some of the examples that we had uh, from a, a product standpoint as a vendor, from a project standpoint uh, where we work with customers uh, to explain how iteration should be done. So the important thing initially is to start with a business architecture. So this is almost always the starting point. Uh, so it can be uh, some kind of a business analyst. We call some people business architects. We rely on these people uh, to, to understand the requirements. There might be existing systems. They might be working in some ways. Uh, or there might be new requirements that people have come up with in some kind of meetings. You need to translate that. Uh, but you don't need to translate that into a 500 page uh, requirement specification and say, uh, you pick uh, whatever five pages you want out of this, call it phase one. That is not what uh, this is all about. It is about understanding a small bit of it, uh, which, which gives you uh, like an overall view of this is the start, this is the end, but in a very small scale. So that translation uh, needs to happen. So we want a business architect to understand this, uh, or the business analyst uh, to understand this, uh, to kind of uh, think about requirements uh, to be things that uh, take the overall objective and, and try to uh, see the overall objective or realize the overall objective from the first go. The second thing uh, is architecture. Now, uh, people are talking these days about uh, processes that are continuous, processes that can be fully automated, uh, approaches to make sure that you keep building uh, in a very methodical and organized way, uh, keep moving forward. Um, so if you want to do CD or whatever, CI, CD, whatever they call it, architecture is key. So there are several stages of architecture as well. Business architecture or the business analysts Requirements gathering is only the first step. Solutions architecture is important. Uh, we tend to talk to customers and tell them, come up with a L0 architecture, refine it into a L1 architecture. What do we mean by this? L0 architecture is like you have lots of blocks. You think in terms of functionality. You say, I want an MDM. I want uh, some kind of a gateway. I want uh, some kind of a, you know, business rules, business process component. You, 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 you 
kind of create your architecture in terms of blocks. LZ, L, L, the, so the refinement of this L0 architecture where you go to L1 is then trying to understand how you can map uh, actual tools, technologies into these functional components. But now this is actually only helping the vendor understand what products are the best fit for you. That is not going to help you design your application because if you just get a set of blocks, say I want uh, integration, vendor says you get ESB. Uh, you say, I want business rules, uh, business processes. Uh, we basically say, you get a BPM and business process server. Now, that is only going to help you understand what kind of tools you want. So the failure of most of this RFI, RFP, RFQ, whatever processes that we have, is that they generally focus uh, on these business requirements, and then they ask a vendor, give me a solution to these business requirements. It stops, basically, at that L1 architecture phase. It doesn't go beyond that. Sometimes it goes a little beyond that, but not fully. You don't realize the rest of it. But then application architecture is very, very important. So it's about integration, data models, APIs, things like that. Now, in this phase, be it a system integrator, be it a vendor, uh, you as a customer need to work with them. You have to sit together, work in an iterative approach to kind of tell, this is what I thought, what do you think about it? Then the, the, the vendor or the system integrator will basically say, this is the solution that I came up with. And then you will tell him, um, can I see a, a, a smaller functional version of it, the first step in the iterative process. The vendor will then go and create it. It's only then, actually, you will see what is your integration need. We have seen customers come and tell us, I want an integration platform. And we propose a large integration platform that has several functional components. Generally. This is uh, a result of a tender or RFP, RFQ process. But when the customer starts adopting this, now they say, I've got a very expensive, very big, very clunky platform. But I don't want all of this. I just want a small bit of it. Why does that happen? That happens because you don't see uh, your objectives, your applications as iterations. You see the overall picture, uh, and, 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 and then you try to do the overall picture in the first go. Now, this is not the way. The painting was drawn. This is not the way the, the, uh, uh, something was launched uh, into outer space. They took it step by step. Uh, so how do you go from business architecture to solution architecture, then improve the application architecture, and obviously, finally, into runtime architecture, because capacity planning, uh, security, all of these things are very important. You are not going to put something into production that falls apart, right? Um, there is a very uh, connected approach uh, in going from step uh, a to step B to step C to step D. And let's try to understand our proposal, our proposition uh, to most of the customers. Before that, there is one thing important. So there is a lot of processes that you need to consider in addition to tools and architecture. I got this slide, uh, this uh, graphic. Uh, I searched for several, but this is very interesting because this actually uh, shows you another kind of spaghetti in your enterprise. So you are trying to clean up all of these APIs, uh, all of the uh, service endpoints. You are going from a heavyweight ESB into a uh, smaller uh, lean integration server. But what about your actual processes of using integration? What about your existing uh, approaches that reside in the business? Um, there are lots of different things. Uh, CIO comes and says, I have this uh, uh, you know, overall insight into IT. CTO comes and says, I have a technology roadmap. Uh, let's do this. Some others, basically, some other leads, some other um, uh, parts of the organization come and say, I have uh, various requirements from products. I have various requirements from uh, overall IT. I have this uh, center of excellence. I have this requirement, I have that requirement. Your process space is also a spaghetti, just like an integration um, uh, a spaghetti, which, which uh, you saw in the previous presentations. And then there is also this other misconceptions. Uh, there is this whole introduction of DevOps. People always like hype words. So we go from a traditional uh, stage approach. We get DevOps. These guys can magically do everything. And you give a big block of your process and say, uh, let's get this team of 10 people or 20 people or two people, three people, I don't know, various sizes of DevOps teams. 
let's tell them you do part of agile you do part of it you basically run the whole thing and they assume that that magically solves uh, this uh, scenario that does not solve it, it uh, fully it might solve some of the obvious challenges that you had communication improves uh, people are more efficient in what they do they are they are actually uh, contributing to the overall objectives they are fully in control of what you want uh, but the scope of the work that they need to do as an ops person is monumental the challenge is you keep doing the devops in such a kind of a unorganized uh, setting for a long time you will realize that over time uh, your golden rules are broken your objectives are not met you are introducing more challenges into the system and uh, if you are an older organization you will see that your company was similar to what it was 10 or 20 years ago in 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 sometime in the future so you need to avoid this how do you avoid that when you get something like this and when someone says solve this please you need to think what was said on the keynote so need is not what actually you might want so need is like um, i i can quote the same example if you're going from a to b you can take any car any mode of transport um, you'll still get from a to b and the time might be same sometimes you might not want to take a car you might go by the train but it might be faster but still people drive people drive in various kinds of cars so there is a reason for that there is a reason because people start thinking differently uh, so it's the same with software you might start with a platform version 1 now this is the kind of thing that you actually wanted um, so we might come and propose uh, various things like um, to connect your existing services uh, you basically uh, want to integrate it with the rest of the ecosystem go ahead use an esb um, security we say use identity server registry repository uh, is useful because it gives you this overall view tracks versioning uh, you can get some uh, states you can uh, have environments all of these things um, you introduce other components as well now you bring in the first project you bring in the second project you bring in the third project the first few things will always work after that there are challenges now you need to think wait a second I bought an integration platform I thought it does everything but it can't connect to the outside world it's not exposing the api's uh, into my partners uh, it's it's not getting these uh, requirements of mine sorted how to solve it wso2 of course will say of course we have more components we have more products um, uh, we can give you analytics we can give you insights we can give you api gateways everything but what are you doing here you are in fact creating platform 2.0 you are improving your platform now this is the iterative step this is where you need to think if you did not do platform 2.0 you will end with platform 1.0 and you'll be force fitting everything what happens if you do that we have seen some customers do that the esb has become you know like mountains uh, there are such a lot of things going into the esb and then we come and say i think now you have a opportunity to go for the new version of this product it's far more efficient but the customer comes back and tell us i can't migrate i can't move there's such a lot of customization on my ESB, I can't go forward. Why does that happen? You have, you have thought too much uh, about platform one. Now, what he should have done is think about platform 2.0. Now, platform 2.0 obviously includes more components. I have platform 3.0, which includes even more components. This might look like a very interesting uh, proposition from a vendor to sell more of his technology. It is not what I want to tell here. Sometimes you, your platform 1.0 might be like this. You might have lots of components. After that, you might improve the efficiency of your business, move from on-premise to cloud most of the time. Many people do that. Once you do that, actually, you might have the opportunity to think again about platform 1.0. Maybe you can reduce some of the components. Maybe you can lose some of the existing things. So just like you are adding more and more capabilities, there is also an opportunity to reduce some of the capabilities the idea of platform one platform two platform three is to basically iteratively improve your co-offering your co-solution which provides all of these uh, services 
uh, to the rest of your organization and have exactly what you want. Do not start with all of the components that come into your mind as an architect. Focus on your requirement. Focus on what people want to do. If you wanted to just get from A to B, you can select any kind of product here, uh, rework it, extend it. You can even get a application server to become an ESB. You can even get a message broker to become an ESB. You can overwork a product into anything. As long as you are good at programming, you can make a marvel come out of a molehill. I, I'm, it's, it's always possible. That is not the objective here. The objective is to try to understand the platform as something that improves with your requirements. Now, all of this is very interesting, great concepts, but how to be on time? It is not easy to be on time. So many projects actually don't fail because of technology. It fails because of many other reasons. Some of the reasons are due to various uh, aspects, the aspirations of people in the business itself. They might come and say the strategy has changed, but actually what they mean is it's not the strategy that changed. They might not like a particular kind of vendor. They might want another kind of vendor. So the actual reason might be something else. Sometimes uh, it might be that uh, you ran out of time uh, because of some other reason. And, and then regardless of how good the tool is, you cannot deliver. You cannot come up with uh, the overall solution, and then it looks like a massive failure. The reason is you have not coordinated your iterative process properly. The key is actually to manage your requirements. I, I got this uh, graphic from Wikipedia. It was very useful because it gives you an overall view of various things that you need to be doing in a typical project. Now, we as a vendor try to talk to you about great things, about platforms, tools that we have, uh, and, and promote new concepts. But then, how do you go and adapt these things practically in your organizations? You have to consider these aspects. There is a concept of capturing the business requirements, modeling your business, basically. Uh, translating that into requirements that the vendors or system integrators understand. Analysis, implementation, testing, building, taking into production, and so on and so forth. One thing that is not clear on this graphic is it just kind of shows a very traditional model where all of the business modeling requirements analysis happens at the beginning and they assume that it will always end. That is not the case. Reality is not this. Reality will have various spikes of various things coming along the line. And it's just like the test phase that you see here. There will be various things that you need to do in various points in time. Now, this is not being... Uh, you know, unorganized. So it is not uh, being an uncontrolled process. This is natural. Because when people see things being built, they participate in what you build. They kind of come up with new ideas, new thoughts that might be very useful, very creative. So listen to your teams. Ask them what do they want from this platform. You as an architect, if you sit and say, this is what you're going to get. This is the platform that I have built with this vendor. It might not help the business. The reason is, the business actually only starts to see and understand what an integration platform is or what an analytics platform is, is after they start using it. It's only then you get various requirements, analysis happens after that. It's only then that the implementation becomes meaningful. So don't go by this diagram. Think of an improved version of this diagram where you basically have these stages overlapping with each other, happening at various times. So managing all of this is very important. How do you do that? So just like the platform 1.0, platform 2.0, platform 3.0, there is a similar model that we have worked out with customers for projects or components. Uh, project 1.0 focuses on something minimum, something uh, that serves your basic requirements. Almost all the time, the first version of any project that we build with a customer tends to be an MVP. Regardless of what you call it, that is an MVP. Why is it an MVP? That is because you and I thought this is the best way to implement this project. We did something, and uh, we have produced something uh, that satisfies the initial requirements. So that is the minimum viable product. Some customers of ours have thought this minimum viable product can last for 10 or 15 years. That might be the case in some aspects, because they might know exactly what they want. But it is not the most common thing. Most of the time, we basically see that an MVP will evolve. The reason is, it's only after you build something, people will understand what this is. 
If you already had something existing, you're moving from an older platform to a new platform, yes, I understand. You might be able to build the exact same thing with a new platform. Then it might be a little bit more than an MVP. But most of the time, you will have an MVP if it's a new project or if it's an improvement to an existing project. And MVP can be things like all internal, and it might have 1.0 versions of components. Now you'll start improving it. You'll get feedback, you'll add new requirements, you'll work with the vendor, refine it. You might go from uh, version 1.0 of one component to a 1.1 of one component. If you keep repeating that, you will add more capabilities. You'll now expose APIs to the outside world. Uh, you will get people to uh, come in with external access. You will add security. Uh, you will get a version 2.0, a major change into some components. And you might also retain your existing components in the system. Now, the key is not to think all projects will initially be all internal and will be uh, that you will get user feedback in the second stage. That is not what I mean here. The key to understand is just like platform 1.0, platform 2.0, there's the same concept for project. There is the same concept for granular components uh, inside the projects. Now, if you take a look at the way we build uh, the carbon platform in our company, we see that it is similar. Uh, we have products, they have versions. We have a platform that has a version number. Inside the products, you get components, even those have version numbers. So it's not just the customer who sees the pattern. Even the vendor sees the same pattern. Talk to a system integrator. They will also tell you that they have seen the same pattern. But now the challenge is, if you go with a WS2 solution, how can we help capture these version numbers? How can we help manage all of these things? Because I showed you uh, a kind of spaghetti in your process. Kasum showed you a kind of spaghetti uh, in an integration platform in the previous presentation. If you have a lot of project version numbers, component version numbers, that's your third spaghetti. That's, that's when you create another kind of mess. Because such a lot of versions can't manage these things. Uh, creates a separate problem of, I don't know what's running in there. It might break all of a sudden. I don't know how to go back to the previous version, likewise. So to manage this, there are several options available. WSO2 has a product called the Governance Registry. We've been continuously improving this project uh, uh, to, to make it possible for you to capture various kinds of digital assets. It went from being a very administrative tool to something that can be now used by business users for some use cases. Further improvements to this product will help you basically go ahead and capture versioning uh, details for more granular components, more granular assets uh, in your enterprise uh, infrastructure. We, we improved our IDE uh, over time uh, to basically help you work with projects, to, to, to work with hierarchical project structures. There are, of course, improvements that we still need to add to these products, uh, but we are working on these things. And you yourself can, can do uh, something as well. You can use uh, things like build systems. You can use things uh, such as uh, repositories, be it Maven, be it Dreadle, be it something else, uh, or, or be it Ant. Uh, all of these build systems in Java, or if you take the same equivalent in uh, Visual Studio or something else, uh, they always have versioning strategies. It's important not to just use a versioning strategy. It's important to understand that your versioning strategy uh, should consider platform, project, and also components. That is how you can very easily iterate from step A to step B to step C to step Z. So I want to leave you with this quote. This is from Albert Einstein. So he said uh, that uh, a, uh, a journey is just like riding a bike. Uh, to keep your balance, you must keep moving. This applies to anything. It's not just uh, for the humans. It's for projects, it's for any achievement uh, that you want to make. Think of it as a journey that you need to keep moving forward. If you don't keep moving forward, you will eventually uh, lose uh, your stability and you will fall. Thank you.